Good afternoon, Dr. Yasel. How are you today? I think, uh, let me take you off of mute here. There, how's that? That's perfect. That's perfect. Uh, how are you doing today? Doing all right. Doing all right. How are you? Good. We will get started in just a few minutes. Um, I'm going to ask everyone to stay on mute and keep your cameras off today. If you have any questions during our discussion, please drop those into the chat uh, and we will get to those uh, questions as we move through our discussion with Dr. Eric Yazel, the Clark County Health Officer. Uh, this is being recorded. Uh, we will record this and we will uh, post that to YouTube later today. So please, again, go ahead and keep yourself on mute and your videos off today just to preserve the bandwidth and make the recording just a little bit easier. So we'll get started in just a minute. Are you, are you uh, in clinic today or are you at home or? I am in clinic today, uh, just uh, just finished up, and then uh, some meetings this afternoon. So. Great, great. Well, we, are, we have a full house. It looks like lots of folks joining us today. Everyone is really excited uh, to hear a COVID update and um, learn, what, learn what you know. So I'm admitting, admitting lots of, of lots of folks. Well, good deal, good deal. Excited to uh, answer some questions and hopefully, uh, you know, provide some transparency and keep everything as fair and balanced and all that good stuff. Okay, I think we are in a good position, Dr. Yazel, to go ahead and get started today. So thanks again for joining us for another community conversation. Uh, joining us today is uh, Dr. Eric Yazel, the Clark County Health Officer and the Chief Medical Officer for uh, LifeSpring Health System. So we're really excited, Dr. Yazel, to have to have you with us and to just kind of catch us up on everything uh, that is going going on with COVID. So just a reminder for our attendees: this is being recorded. It will be shared uh, publicly. If that's a if that's an issue for you, please go ahead and disconnect at this time. We've asked that you please keep yourself on mute and your cameras off, and uh, we'll go ahead and get started. So. Uh, Dr. Yazel, I think you might be the busiest person in Southern Indiana right now. So I just want to start off by asking, how, how are you? How's it going? I'm doing all right. I always make the joke. It sounds like the old cartoon where the dam springs a leak and you put your finger in it and four or five more areas take off. But uh, we're doing all right. There's a lot of good people down here all working together to, uh, to get things back in the right direction. So. Well, how, how are we doing in terms of epi data? How are we doing in terms of community spread? Yeah, we've, uh, we've been for about the last four weeks, kind of a steady rise. And over the last two weeks, that rise kind of started to peak up a little sh more sharply as well. Um, you know, we started to see some reports of the Delta variant in other parts of the country. And when our numbers uh, started to take a turn, we assumed that was the case. There's a little bit of lag time before we get that confirmation. And we have since got that, and most of our cases are that. And so we've had some some increased activity, um, you know, uh, over that. And we've seen the community spread as a result. And uh, now we're trying to uh, figure out how to uh, get the uh, get things flattened and heading back in the right direction again. You've brought up the the Delta variant, which is the CDC is called a variant of concern. Uh, and and I'll just speak from my own experience and talking with other uh, professionals. This time feels different. Uh, has that been your experience as well? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think some of it's just community factors. I mean, we had a nice little stretch there from April to through June where you know, it didn't seem like COVID was such a, you know, intrusive thing in our everyday lives and, you know, kind of got back to a, a nice sense of normalcy. And so I think that's it more than anything. We were all just so tired and it was just a breath of fresh air. And then here we are again now, um, you know, having to uh, having to talk about it. And, uh, you know, that's frustrating for everybody, including myself. There's nobody that wants this gone more than I do. I can, I can assure you that. And, uh, you know, the thing that's different about Delta is it's more, <clears throat> excuse me, it's much more infectious. It, uh, you know, the average person only previously, if they're exposed to, if they had COVID, would give it to two other people in the community. And Delta is up to like eight people. 
And so that presents some whole new challenges that we haven't uh, had to experience before at a time when nobody's really excited about dealing with this. We're all tired and, and have COVID fatigue. So I want to make sure I understand what you just said. Um, and with the uh, transmissibility of COVID. So when someone has uh, COVID, which is the, the Delta COVID, when they infect someone, they're, they're likely gonna infect eight more people. And then those eight people will infect eight more people. And that's why we're seeing the rapid spread. Exactly. That's why, you know, that's what makes us nervous from a community standpoint. You know, you can go from a very small number of cases to, to a large number of cases, um, you know, rapidly. And with that increase in infectivity, um, you know, like I said, especially in any kind of communal settings is a big challenge to, uh, to keep it contained, especially among unvaccinated populations. Okay. Uh, and all of this you indicated is kind of leading to this kind of general sense of frustration. Uh, and, I, and I think we've talked about, you and I have talked about that before, and, and certainly we're hearing, hearing a lot of that. What are some things people can do to, to sort of take care of take care of themselves and take care of their mental health? Well, one thing I think everybody needs to be understanding of everybody else. Every single person in our community has had a different uh, different COVID experience. I mean, you know, I work in the ER. I see the sickest of the sick. I was just talking to a friend in northern Indiana who farms and, you know, doesn't, you know, doesn't encounter a lot of other people. And he still to this day hasn't seen, you know, any significant COVID effects in, in his area. So, we all have our own different experiences, and then the data that we hear affects that. And so I think, number one, we need to be understanding of each other and respectful of each other's views and things. Number two, and I've said this all along, is, you know, find a couple tr uh, trusted sources of information, you know, get updated 15, 30 minutes a day, and then unplug. It's not good for any of us to hear this constant barrage of information that are coming from, you know, sources of different quality and different agendas and things like that. That's not good for our mental health. And after a while, it leaves you with no idea what to believe because it's coming at you from all angles. I think that's a really important point. Uh, you talk about just making sure that there is, uh, that you've got a source of good information. Uh, how do you know what is a good source of information? Uh, you know, recently there was a, a physician in Northern Indiana and, and we know that, that people really trust and should trust their doctors and healthcare professionals. Who, who spoke really, really eloquently and strongly at a school board meeting. Uh, I, think, I think you said it was your, your alma mater um, and, and sounded very convincing. How can people sift through what is valid and accurate and evidence-based data uh, to make good decisions for themselves? Well, I think it's important that we all uh, critically think, you know, and, and kind of evaluate, step back and evaluate what we're listening to. You know, listen for bias, you know, understand, um, you know, the, the agenda that may be at present and things like that, then, and then just look for evidence-based things. And, you know, again, studies should have, you know, 50,000, 100,000, you know, even more participants. They should be set up to where you have a case and control and you're, you know, you're, and you're comparing those for outcomes and things like that. And that process takes time. And I think that's been one of the, uh, I guess, most unusual things about COVID is we're watching the scientific method unfold in front of our eyes at all times. And when you try to make a generalization too quickly, that can be really harmful. Uh, you know, we're, we saw that with ventilators. I mean, the initial data said everybody with COVID who, you know, reaches a certain oxygen requirement, you should think about putting them on a ventilator. We found out that's exactly the wrong thing to do. You know, some of the other things, you know, the um, hydroxychloroquine and the uh, convalescent plasma, um, some things like that, that you know, we get preliminary data and you want to act on it. And then you find out later that, that, that the benefit is, you know, either just minimal or, or not at all. And, you know, you have to wait till the science, um, you know, tells you what to do. You can't just throw things at the wall and see, see what sticks. And I always joke, if I see 15 patients with COVID today and I tell them all to go home tonight and take a shot of Woodford Reserve and none of them go to the hospital, that doesn't mean I, cur I cured COVID with Woodford Reserve, you know, and that's, that's a, you know, a generalization that, you know, you can make very easily if you don't look at the science. So. I do think at this point we need to emphasize that you are not indicating that Woodford Reserve is a treatment for COVID. This is correct. This is correct. Okay, moving on. I want to go back a little bit uh, and just talk about testing because I think it's been a while since we've done this and it's a good idea to just maybe refresh on the basics. Can you talk a little bit about the different types of testing that is available and when it is indicated? 
Sure, sure. And I'm going to keep it kind of simple because you can really get in the weeds on this, but there's basically a rapid test and then a PCR test um, as far as testing goes. And the rapid test, obviously, you get back in about 15 minutes in most of these locations. Um, and for that speed, you sacrifice some accuracy, you know, especially if there's not a very high viral load or early in infection. And so the second test is the PCR test, which has some better accuracy. Um, but it does take a lot of times, uh, you know, 24, 48, 72 hours to come back. What I usually recommend is if you're symptomatic, it's worthwhile to get the rapid test because your, po your false positive rate on those are, are really very low. Um, so if you're positive, you can reasonably assume that you're positive, especially if you have it, if you take one in the setting of you having symptoms. If you're negative and having symptoms, then we do recommend you follow that up with a more accurate test because we do see a lot of those instances where somebody's negative on the rapid and they become positive on the PCR. So that's kind of the gist of it. That's fast. The rapid's faster, but less accurate, um, better for if you're having symptoms. For screening on asymptomatic people, the PCR is the way to go because of the better accuracy. And then the last is the antibody test. And I get a lot of questions on this. And, you know, it's one of those that sounds great in theory, but unfortunately in accuracy, it's not great. You can't make, um, you know, definitive quarantine decisions or assumptions about your own immunity and things like that. You know, even for vaccinated people, you know, the vaccine is to that spike protein. Well, some of the antibody tests look for a different part of the virus. Um, and so, you know, you may test negative for antibodies and be protected. And vice versa, there's some false reactivity on it um, where you get some false positives where, you know, you might think you're protected, you know, make some different decisions and, and put yourself and others at risk. So unfortunately, that one's not ready for prime time yet. I hope the science catches up soon where it is. But. And is that uh, why we can't use the antibody test to determine immunity or whether or not someone is appropriate for vaccination? Yeah, that's correct. I get I get that question a lot because it makes, you know, it makes sense, you know, at the superficial level. But when you get down to it and look at the statistics on its accuracy and things like that, it's just that's why the state and CDC and, you know, most uh, most uh, authorities recommend not using that for, uh, you know, for definitive decision making. For your own curiosity, it's fine. But, you know, under, make sure you understand, you know, the limitations of that test uh, before you make broad interpretations. One of the things that you did in advance of this was ask for questions uh, on your professional Facebook page. So thanks, thanks for helping me uh, get prepared. Uh, and someone had submitted a question uh, related to their own personal situation where both they and their spouse had been vaccinated and then had had antibody testing later where one had tested with uh, antibodies and one hadn't. Uh, did that mean that they were uh, that they didn't have an immunological protection or that they needed to be revaccinated? You know, that, and that's kind of back to what we, we said that you can't make, unfortunately, those broad-based assumptions um, on that antibody test. You may test negative and be very well protected. Conversely, you may be positive and, and, and not have that protection. So, you know, I think one of the biggest mistakes we've made all along is, is being able to, afraid to say, I don't know. And in that scenario, we don't, you know, you know, I would assume with the efficacy of the vaccine being as high as it is, you know, even still, I'm sure we'll probably talk about that. You know, if you've been vaccinated, you can reasonably assume that you are protected, um, but you can't use the antibody test to, to prove or disprove that. Okay, great. Um, you know, there's quite a bit of disinformation out there about testing and vaccination, and we touched on that a, a few minutes ago. Uh, what about this kind of uh, this rumor another day, another rumor that uh, the tests are picking up uh, influenza and not COVID? Yeah, the, uh, they sent out a uh, thing talking about the emergency use, author, emergency use authorization of a certain kind of COVID test. And then it mentioned, you know, the new test was going to be able to take to test for both COVID and the flu. And people and a lot of people interpreted that and some people really facilitated people misinterpreting that as the prior test could not determine between that. The original test is specific for COVID itself, so that was not an issue. What they were thinking is, while our data was looking better from a COVID standpoint, they are anticipating a, you know, a, a, an actual flu season this coming year. We didn't really have one last year, and they wanted to give a mechanism to test for both COVID and flu at the same time with one swab. And so that's why I was saying, we're pulling the emergency use for this and saying, we wanna put this one out there that can test for both makes a ton of sense. I, I'm not sure I want, you know, uh, you know, a flu test in one nostril and a COVID test in the other. Now, you know, as we're COVID's come back up, you know, and masking's kind of coming back around again, 
you know, we may not see another big flu season this year, so it may not be as necessary, but that was the motivation behind that. And it really got twisted, um, you know, um, in, and delivered in an inappropriate way to a lot of people. And, you know, that's what it's, it's just hard from a messaging side standpoint to not get too in the weeds to explain things, but then you leave that door open for people to twist the interpretation. So to be clear, what, what the, um, discussion point was was really just using a single swab to run two different tests not exactly. to use two swabs to run two tests exactly they basically said yeah we don't need an emergency use for this one anymore we want to do this one that can test for both at the same time which makes a ton of sense okay great thank you for clearing that up uh, I want to transition the discussion a little bit into just uh, symptomology. What is is COVID still primarily a respiratory disease? I mean, what types of symptoms are you seeing in patients? It's it, you know it kind of shifts over time. Lately, the pattern seems to be um, you know body aches, um, some sinus congestion, which is obviously problematic this time of year because a lot of people have that trouble anyway, and then fevers along with it. And then as the, as the course of the illness progresses, then you start to see a little more of the respiratory side of things. And that's what usually when somebody has to get hospitalized for COVID, it's typically due to the respiratory side of things. They just get at an oxygen level that it's not safe to be at home anymore and they need to come in the hospital for some supplemental oxygen and things like that. And if someone has COVID, if they've tested positive, how do they know it's time to seek an additional level of care? How, is it, how do they know it's time to come to the hospital? Yeah, I, I think that's one thing. It's a challenge because it's, it's scary for people. Like we get a lot of people who just find out they're positive and then come down to the hospital because they think they may need some, you know, some, some more care and things. And that's not necessarily the case. You know, I know this is an oversimplified thing, but it's, you know, listen to your body. And if you feel like you're struggling to breathe or, you know, you're getting dehydrated because you're not eating or things like that, then come down. We'll, we'll be happy to give, you know, some supportive care, some fluids, some oxygen, you know, things like that. So, you know, you know, just you let your body do the talking for you. And when you feel like you need some help, then, then seek medical attention and, and we'll be there for you. Right. Thank you. Um, before, when we were talking about community spread, you said uh, that uh, positive started to increase. We thought that we might have Delta and then so, you know, it was confirmed. How does that happen? When do uh, tests or swabs get tested for, for variants? Uh, you know, what is the process for that? Yeah, so basically, the, you know, the initial swab just says you have COVID. It doesn't tell you anything about what kind of COVID or anything like that. And then uh, a proportion of those swabs go to the state and they tell you, you know, they start telling you what kind, they do what's called sequencing that tells you what specific kind of variant it is. That takes time, you know, just shipping time and do the sequence them, sequencing themselves and things like that. So when I say, you know, we assumed it was here and then it showed later, that's exactly how that works. You find out after the fact. They don't do every test that comes through or anything, but when there's a new variant coming, then a lot of times they'll do some increased sampling to try to determine when it arrives. And, and that's what they did here. Now in the state of Indiana, it's I think over 90% are all Delta. So reasonably you can assume if you're COVID positive within the last couple of weeks, you can assume you have the Delta variant pretty reasonably. Okay. And what is it about Delta that makes it different? I know you indicated that it was more transmissible. Is it uh, more dangerous for the person who gets it? Uh, does it lead to increased mortality? Yeah, we're not seeing that, to be honest with you. And we're not seeing an increased uh, severity, at least locally. We've seen some more hospitalizations than we have in the past, but that's more because we're also seeing more cases. You know, before we might've had, you know, a hundred cases in the community and, and, you know, 10 people in the hospital. Now we see a thousand with a hundred, you know, that's, it's just a proportion to the, uh, the amount of cases that are out there. The severity does not seem to be any more severe than some of the old, the other variants that we've had in the past, at least at the local level. There's some studies, you know, nationwide and worldwide that, you know, are a little bit more all over the place on that, but at least from what we're seeing, um, we're not seeing an increased severity. And how are the vaccines, and I know this is a whole new uh, area that we're gonna that we're gonna move into, but how are the vaccines holding against uh, the current strains in the community? Yeah, they, uh, so we're still, you know, despite, I think a lot of the breakthrough cases get kind of really publicized, but in general, the efficacy is still really good. Um, I just saw a study uh, from, from Indiana that said uh, Pfizer's around 88% um, effective um, 96% effective in keeping you out of the hospital. 88% just can 
um, preventing you from getting COVID. Moderna is a little lower at 72, but also around 96% at seeing you out, at keeping you out of the hospital. And then I just saw for Johnson and Johnson, it was 85% effective for keeping you out of the hospital. So those are still really, really good numbers, you know, lower than what they were a few months ago. And, you know, I do think as time goes on, we'll see a little bit of worsening of those numbers. But, you know, again, if compared to other vaccines that are out there, that's unheard of efficacy. And they're still very, very effective. And are the breakthrough cases, um, which my understanding, that's after somebody's been fully vaccinated two weeks after their last dose, and then they test positive, um, are the breakthrough cases proportionate to the vaccines that have been administered? It seems so, at least locally from what we've seen, there doesn't seem to be one that's, you know, significantly outpacing another. Still waiting on some breakdowns of that from like the state and, and national level, but, but no, and, you know, because I get asked that a lot, which vaccine do you recommend? And obviously, if one had a, you know, markedly increased breakthrough rate versus other, then I would, you know, recommend that. For right now, it just seems more proportional to the, uh, to the shots that are given out there. And, you know, that's one thing I want to stress is I think we vaccinated over 3 million people in the state of Indiana. And as of Tuesday, um, I think they gave me 9,895 breakthrough cases. So that's like a 0.1% um, breakthrough rate. So it is still really, really low. And then, um, you know, the hospitalizations, it's, you know, almost all a phenomenon of unvaccinated, over 90%, and almost all the hospitals locally are, uh, are unvaccinated patients. Uh, one of the things that I thought has been interesting have been when breakthroughs happen in clusters, when you have a family that's vaccinated and they, you'll have multiple people in, in that house that, that develop breakthrough cases, um, which seems almost like a statistical uh, improbability. Um, is that due to like a dose exposure type of situation or do you have, do we know why that happens like that? Yeah, and, and, you know, I'll be clear, we're getting into, you know, what's my theory versus what's scientific fact, and I do think that is. I think it's a, a dose exposure thing. You know, if if I'm, you know, if, if I'm at home with my wife and she's positive, she sneezes, you know, in my vicinity, I'm going to get a very, pretty high viral exposure. You know, if I've got, you know, a kid at home who's sick, who's, you know, up there in his bedroom uh, gaming all day or something like that, I don't encounter him, then, you know, I'm probably in pretty good shape. So, you know, even within house, and then, also, you take into account consideration everybody's got their own variable immune system. And, you know, it's entirely reasonable that there are people out there who have had COVID and, and not known it. So they may be more immune than, you know, than others, you know, someone else who's unvaccinated or things like that. So it's just a, there's just a lot of dynamics at play that make that a very imperfect science and, and very unpredictable. So. Okay. Well, you mentioned uh, children. Uh, so I want to move into talking about uh, the kids. I don't know if anybody's asked you recently about schools, but I want to talk a little bit about the schools. Um, what's up with all of the kids being quarantined and, and uh, coming home from school? One of mine just completed a two week, two week quarantine and um, that can be pretty challenging. So I guess my first question is, um, is it safe for our kids to be in school? Well, yeah, my answer to that's yes. Um, you know, we wouldn't, uh, you know, we wouldn't support it if, it if it wasn't safe. And, you know, that's one thing I think that needs to be said with, you know, with a lot of the meetings being pretty, you know, um, argumentative and things like that. We've been in communication with all the schools in, in our county um, since, since June, um, talking about things. And across the board, student safety is the number one priority. Um, and we've had very good productive uh, conversations. Everybody's working really hard to keep children safe. You know, we as a, as a health department have said, you know, our recommendation is to follow CDC guidelines and we've deferred how to interpret that to the different school boards. And so you've seen some variance across, the, you know, across the county on, on different guidelines and, and things like that. And we understand that and we're working with each school to kind of navigate their, their unique uh, scenarios. And, uh, and yeah, we've seen a lot of quarantines and I think a lot of that is just reflective of increased activity in the community as gener in general. You know, and then we take into effect that You've got, you know, 500 kids, most of whom are unvaccinated under one roof. There is a potential for spread. And that's why you've seen some large quarantines. You've seen a small amount of in-school spread um, and a lot of kids out with cases. And it's, it's made it a uh, rocky start to the fall semester. And that's disappointing for everybody because, I mean, 
with everybody arguing about everything, I think the one thing we can pretty much all agree on is we all want our kids in, in in-person school, um, you know, as, as uninterrupted as possible. So. Uh, you are ticking through the questions that I have quicker than I can ask them. Uh, but one of the questions I had was who actually determines the rules for schools? And it sounds like it's the school board. Yeah, so basically we uh, we as a health department make some recommendations. I, I get this asked a lot, like, you know, are, is this a mandate, a recommendation or a requirement and things like that? You know, all along through COVID, we at least in Clark County, we've tried to have a philosophy of you know, cooperation, education, things like that, instead of a mandate. I think it's a, it's a really slippery slope to say, here's what I want you to do. And if you don't do it, I'm going to mandate it. You know, now if things progress to an unsafe situation and things, those are things we have to consider as far as intervention goes, but our schools and every business and every, basically everything in the county has been really, um, you know, respectful of, of that and working with us when those situations have arisen. So, you know, in general, then it comes down to the different uh, school administrations and school boards to decide how they're going to uh, move forward. And I, I think they've done a, a great job trying to navigate that. It's not, a, not an easy thing. Okay. Well, I don't envy their position for sure. Uh, what, are, what are some of the safest ways for kids to be in school? Well, you know, if I, I say, and I say this, and I know there's, um, you know, different uh, philosophies on masking all across the board. And, you know, I think there's two questions there. You know, number one is, you know, is, is you know, you've got your freedom for parents to de decide if their children's going to wear a mask. And then on the other side of things is, you know, keeping as many kids in school as possible. For this side of things, you know, if you're masked, you're going to have less in-school spread. And then you can actually decrease the quarantine length from our uh, radius from six feet down to three feet. And so you're going to see smaller quarantine numbers and less in-school spread with, with masking across the board. And, you know, some of our schools that have adopted that have seen that they have better uh, quarantine numbers and things like that. On the flip side, you know, the, you know, parent freedom thing, I totally understand that. And so I think each school has to, you know, kind of weigh that of what, you know, what is their number one priority and how do you balance those two factors? And, and that's a tough decision. And, and that's why I say that's not something I can decide for everybody. Now, if it becomes to, you know, comes to a scenario where, like I said, an unsafe, you know, um, situation exists, we're seeing a lot of in-school spread or things like that, and we may have to make some more aggressive recommendations, but right now that's kind of where things land on that. Okay, great. Well, I will uh, let you off the hook on this one and, and move <laughs> on to talking about other factors related to, to children. We had a submitted question related to some of the hospitalized, uh, hospitalized children. H how many of those kids um, don't have any other type of pre-existing conditions. Is this affecting children now like it was affecting adults a year ago where it was just kind of random? You know, I, I do think there's some, um, I guess the, the short answer to that is, is yes to both. I mean, I do think you're seeing some kids who have comorbid medical conditions be a higher risk, kind of like we saw in the adult population. But also you're seeing some, you know, previously healthy, no, uh, you know, no identifiable risk factor children get sick as well. And, you know, that's one of the toughest challenges here is, you know, I think there's a perception out there that, you know, children really, you know, flow right through COVID without much trouble. And honestly, for most kids, that's exactly the case, you know, but there is a very small number that, that have complications from this. And, you know, that's, I guess the balance is, you know, how do you, you know, how do you do what you know is good for kids as far as social interactions, being in school, educational, social development things with risk that the that kids are going to get sick? And I mean, that's not the easy question that I think a lot of people out in the community, um, you know, want that to be. So. Yeah, that's that's a that's a heavy question. Um, when do you have any inside information? When can we expect vaccines for the under 12 group? Yeah, I don't have any great inside info. Um, you know, I know there are some trials and some discussions going on. I know, you know, as long as they can, you know, get good data and, and determine that it's safe, I do think they want to try to lower the vaccination age to, you know, include all school age children, because obviously if they can do that safely, that would, you know, give all parents an option for protection for their kids and hopefully give us a, you know, smoother, um, you know, smoother course or the school year and things like that. So, but, you know, like with anything else, it's not something you want to just rush out there and say, here it is. We need to do our due diligence, you know, do our proper clinical trials and things like that and make sure the data says that it's safe to do that. And that's what's happening right now. I would guess that, you know, 
maybe, uh, you know, late this year, early next year before you could reasonably expect anything like that. But that's a total guess on my part. Um, staying with the discussion on children, what types of recommendations do you have for children who play contact sports or outdoor sports? I mean, we're moving into the to the fall sports season. Yeah, I mean, I make I make no bones about it. I'm a big sports fan. And, you know, I want uninterrupted high school and college uh, sports and all that thing as as much as possible. And, you know, there are some things, you know, football is always really challenging. Obviously, there's, a, you know, uh, you know, you have piles and, you know, tackling and things like that. And so, you know, we try to say, you know, keep it to the individual position drills and things like that as much as possible so that you can if you do have an exposure, you know, it's, it's, it's hard not to quarantine an entire team because there's so much interaction there, you know, 15 within 15, uh, within six feet for 15 minutes. I mean, that's going to get a whole offense and defense most of the time. And so the more you can, you know, take those precautions, be able to track somebody through a practice and thing, the more interrupted it will be. And then, you know, again, just frequent hand washing, you know, hand sanitizer, things like that. And then watch your transportation to and from practices. That's where we see a lot too, where, You'll have, you know, six or seven kids all packed in a car and one of them becomes positive and that's a good way to, you know, to get a whole team knocked out. So it's just a, you know, it's a challenge and there's no perfect answer there. And Hopefully we won't have to go back to, you know, capacity issues and things like that. I've not heard any plans for that. So, uh, you know, hopefully we'll uh, we'll still have our uh, our sports seasons as uninterrupted as possible. Dr. Yazel, can you talk a little bit about um, some of the behavioral health issues in children uh, related to COVID? I think that's been a real concern for a lot, of, a lot of us who are parents, but a lot of uh, health professionals as well. Uh, what what have you been seeing, and then what can we do to help help our youth? Yeah, it's. Well, I think that's one of the toughest things about COVID right now. I mean. You know, number one, you're forcing kids to think of, you know, worldly things that they have no business thinking about right now. You know, they're asking very, you know, serious questions about their own mortality and things like that. No, you know, no child should have to think about that. And unfortunately, you know, a lot of times there's there's no way around it. But I think it is important, you know, from the parental level to have, you know, discussions with kids about COVID so they understand and things and and try to, again, keep it fair and balanced and, and well sourced there. You know, but the other thing is, you know, you're seeing a lot of, uh, you know, with the interruptions at school, that's why there's so much discussion about this. Because like I said, we all want our kids in school because when they're not, you miss that social uh, and, you know, and, and emotional development. We've seen a rise in gun violence over in Louisville as a result, you know, from that, that you know, school-aged population that hasn't been in school. Um, there's increased depression, increased substance abuse. I mean, there's so many different things that are, are kind of decompensating during this time period that makes figuring all this out, um, absolutely crucial to our kids. Right. And if someone, a parent has a concern um, related to their child's mental health, uh, what would you recommend? Well, number one, you know, I think the first step is, is, is just having a discussion with them and, and, and drawing them out. You know, they may not say anything. You know, I've, I found that with my own kids. You know, I've asked them, I'm like, hey, you know, tell me what you know about COVID. What do you think? And, you know, what do you worry about? And things like that. I think, you know, it's really important initially to have that conversation just so you understand, um, you know, what their thought process is, what their fears are and things like that. And then if you really feel, you know, if you start to notice that, you know, your child's really heading in the wrong direction or having some issues, then reach out and, and, and get professional help uh, because this isn't an easy thing for anyone to navigate. And so don't be afraid to, to ask for help uh, because, like I said, it's a, it's a challenge for across the board and, and especially for our, for our young folks. And there are lots of places in our community to get professional help, uh, LifeSpring, Wellstone, pediatricians. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, you know, first and foremost, find a, find a trusted person who either is in that field or knows, you know, where to, where, uh, you know, what some resources might be and, and reach out to them. And, and like you said, from a health department side of things, from LifeSpring, Wellstone, there's a, well, there's a ton of options out there. And, and all willing to help and, and, and want to help. Great. Uh, I want to transition into uh, vaccination. We've talked to kind of around uh, the issue, but I want to really dive into it because there's been a lot going on uh, with vaccination. So just briefly uh, touch on the different types of uh, vaccination that are available in the U.S. 
Yeah, so I mean, the big three here are, uh, you know, Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson and Johnson. Pfizer and Moderna are, are very similar in, in how they work, and properties, and and you know, side effect profile and things like that. Johnson and Johnson is a, it, the the Pfizer and Moderna are the mRNA vaccines, which is a newer technology. The Johnson and Johnson is, has a very similar delivery and profile as some some of the vaccines that we've used more in the past. Um, you know, you do sacrifice, the Johnson & Johnson is very nice because it's one dose. You do sacrifice a little bit of efficacy with that one dose. It's it's not quite as protective, but still very, very good. Um, and, you know, and some people choose that route because for the one dose thing and from, you know, from the fact that it's similar to some vaccines that they may have had in the past. A lot of other people choose Pfizer and Moderna. I, like I tell people, there's no right or wrong answer to that. The right answer is to get vaccinated. Um, whichever one you use is just depends on your own preference and what's um, readily available. Okay. Um, when we had talked before, you indicated that uh, significant side effects from the vaccines would appear within weeks or months if there were going to be uh, significant side effects. Has that happened? You know, it, I guess it depends on your uh, your definition of significant. Do a lot of feel people feel like crap for a, you know for a couple of days after their vaccines? Yeah, I mean fever, body aches, headaches, things like that. Like I have a lot of people say, yeah, it put me on my tail for 24 hours and then I was fine. And that's the thing is most of those vaccine side effects, you know, are very short lived. And you know, if you can tough it out for a day or two, then you have you know you know protection for months if not longer. So you know it's a it's a it's a trade off that's well worth it in my eyes and. We, as far as long-term side effects, um, you know, we just really aren't seeing that. I mean, again, I think there's a public perception out there that the side effects are, you know, much more significant than what they are. And, you know, we've had very few um, hospitalizations or any significant illness that's directly tied to the vaccines. Um, would we have seen, uh, seen those long-term effects by now? You'd certainly start. You'd certainly expect to start seeing any long-term effects that, in the history of vaccines, almost all effects have shown up within the first, you know, four or five months after a vaccine delivery. And you know, I think we're at uh, what two billion vaccines delivered worldwide. So I mean, we've got a nice sample size now, and um, we're just not, you know, we're just not seeing. It. We really aren't. I'm not saying there's no side effects or anything like that, but there is absolutely nothing that even remotely approaches the benefit of getting a vaccine, okay? Like there's no side effect that says, you know what, this outweighs getting the vaccine. Your protected, your protected level for COVID outweighs any of those um, in my eyes. And, and I think the science backs that up. Okay. And how much data do we actually have? I know you mentioned 2 billion people. How much data do we have on the people who have received uh, vaccines? Yeah, I mean, now, I mean, we have an unheard of amount of data for this vaccine. I mean, when this, when this vaccine goes for full FDA approval, there, there's going to be more information that there's ever been in the history of, of any other vaccine. I mean, we have a mountain of data. And to be honest, uh, I always tell everybody, I'm like, you know, if the holdup for you is that it's not been fully approved, then be ready to get your vaccine because that's, you know, this is going to be a pretty slam dunk approval, to be honest. The efficacy rates are higher than almost any vaccine in history. Um, and the side effect profile is low. I mean, so this is going to be a no brainer approval. So, you know, if that's your only holdup, I encourage you to go ahead and go and get it because, you know, that's not really going to be a thing. Um, the, the full approval is coming. And is that is that voluminous data? Is that why we don't have FDA approval? Or do you have any idea what the holdup is at the FDA? I'll be honest. I think they're focusing on, I mean, I know that's a holdup for some people and I get it, but like, I think they're focusing on other things like, hey, how do we, you know, let's study this for the younger population okay. or, you know, what are we doing as far as booster doses? I think there's just other priorities out there right now that, you know, are, that are actually saving lives. And so I think that's why you haven't seen much more moving on that is they're saying, hey, this looks good. We'll get to that. But let's let's focus on the more imminent uh, risk of our population. Okay. Uh, so you brought up third doses for immunocompromised folks. Can you talk a little bit about that? That's that's hot off the presses in the last few days. Yeah, we just got, you know, we just uh, got the approval to start giving that for, you know, stimular transplant patients, chemo patients, you know, things like that. Um, and yeah, so they're recommended a third dose. And, and that makes sense. I mean, those are those are your populations that have the most compromised immune systems. And so it makes sense that, a, that an extra dose essentially for that population um, would help build their immunity up and give them some extra protection. And again, they're, they're using data on that. They've, you know, they've seen 
some of the breakthrough cases are, are tend to be people in that patient population. And so they've responded accordingly with, with recommending that third dose. And we are doing that here locally um, at our health department and health departments and vaccine sites all across uh, Kentucky. Okay, great. Uh, and so then we've also in the last few days heard from federal officials that there will be a booster for uh, people who have re received the first two in the mRNA series. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what's the difference between a, a third dose and a booster and when we can expect to see those third, uh, thir that booster for those of us who've received the mRNA series? Yeah, you know, I think a lot of it's semantics. I mean, those may be identical, if not very, very uh, similar shots. But right now, the third dose is just identical to the, you know, to the, uh, the two doses um, that they were given before for the immune compromised population. Will that booster dose look different? Not that I, not that I know of, but I'm st we're still waiting to hear from, you know, the, the um, you know, supply State Department of Health and CDC and all that on what exactly the booster entails, I think a probably a lot of it's going to be semantics. It's probably going to be very similar to, you know, dose one and dose two as well. But that's still something that we're, we're working out and, and information's coming in by the day. And like I said, we'll be prepared to, uh, to get out, um, you know, whatever booster to the appropriate population um, when it arrives. And we're still hearing what that looks like and, you know, anticipated start dates and things like that. You know, I think it's reasonable to assume that some of that will be rolled out very similar to the initial shot, you know, rollout is, you know, highest risk first and, you know, kind of moving down the H tiers and things like that. Probably will move faster because there's a little different level of urgency. You know, when, when it's first started, people are completely, un, you know, unimmunized. Now you're given a booster. And so, you know, I'm sure there'll be when, when things first open up a, a mad rush and then things will tail, will tail off from there. But we're already making preparations on, on how to, uh, all to serve all our citizens to, to get it to them as soon as possible. When can we expect to see that uh, booster? I think it's reasonable that it'll be sometime this fall. Um, you know, I, I think it will probably be doing in, in September, I would, I would guess. I do know there's some, again, just logistical things, supply things, how the, the tracking system, you know, how do you, how do you make sure that we're, you know, getting people the right doses and things like that. So there's a few things that need to be ironed out. But again, different than the original vaccine rollout, all that framework's already in place. There's just some tweaking that needs to be done to, uh, to be able to move on to the booster side of things. And that'll be pretty easy for everybody. Just a few, you know, some questions that need to be answered and some things that need to be ironed out. But I don't think it'll be anything prolonged. Um, like I said, I, I don't know if we'll be able to sneak it in by the end of the month, but I think, yeah, I think September is probably a, a reasonable time frame. And uh, listening to an interview with Dr. Walensky, the director of the CDC, it's my understanding that that's necessary because of what, what she termed as safety signals related to, um, to a decrease in efficacy um, that, they, that they observed in other countries. Yeah, I think, you know, like anything else, it's, you know, it's a combination of things. Number one, you know, your immune system as time goes on, that protection level is going to kind of decline a little bit. It's been very slow. I mean, we still have pretty good efficacy combined with the variant strains that are, you know, mutating and things that are going to outpace that vaccine. And so figuring out where those two points intersect is, is where they say, okay, when, you know, when the, the mutation rates are high and the efficacy starts to drop, then it's time for a booster shot. Okay, great. Uh, I want to move into just uh, continuing on vaccination, how important it is um, for people to get vaccinated. But but first, a, a submitted question. Uh, if you have had COVID, when can you get vaccinated? I get that. I get asked that a lot. And you'll hear you'll hear some people say, wait 90 days. I think that's fine. Um, that's obviously safe. And if you got one of the antibody infusions when you had it, then you do need to wait that 90 days. Otherwise, what I say is, you know, make sure all your symptoms are gone. And give it, you know, a nice little buffer zone, at least a couple of weeks after your symptoms are gone. And then I think it's reasonable to start thinking about the vaccine there. If you do it too soon where you're still not feeling well, like I said, the side effects will hit you a little bit. I mean, I call it a, you know, four out of 10 on the man's man cold scale. You know, you're going to have body aches and fevers and things like that. And if you're already feeling a little symptomatic, that's going to hit you extra hard. Give it a few weeks to, you know, just really kind of get yourself back up to the full strength. And then I think it's reasonable to start thinking about the vaccine. Is immunity from uh, what we call wild infection enough to carry a person? You know, to some degree, yes. Um, you know, I think it is. I think 
but you can't count on it. You know, it's, it's much more unreliable than, than immunity from others. I mean, they've, they've done some studies that show that, you know, that wild, you know, wild type or just natural COVID infection, you know, it depends on the severity of illness you had. If you're symptomatic versus very ill, depends on your own immune system and things like that. And so, you know, do, am I seeing a lot of repeat infections, you know, with Delta here getting sick that had COVID, one of the other strains? No. And so I do think you, you get some protection there, but actually the, uh, the data says that people who had COVID naturally and then got even one dose of the vaccine are extremely well protected. So if your goal is to be able to walk out there and say, I want to live my life and have a sense of normalcy and not have to, you know, worry about COVID infection, then the vaccine is still absolutely the way to go. But I do, you know, I do think that's something that's probably not recognized enough is you are in good shape still if you had it naturally, but just not, uh, you know, not to the same degree as if you go ahead and get vaccinated. Okay. So then your professional medical recommendation is vaccination. Oh, 100%. 100%. Yeah, I, I agree. I just, you know, I don't want to create the perception that people say like they got no protection unless they get the vaccine, but I still recommend if you had COVID naturally to absolutely get the vaccine, that that will get you up to a, a very solid level of protection that you can feel, feel very comfortable with. Right. Um, we're, we're hearing a lot and seeing a lot on the news, reading a lot on social media about hospitals being full, ICUs being full. Can you give us a sense of you know, what's it really like working in an inpatient facility in our area right now? Yeah, well, I think the first thing that everyone needs to understand is our ICUs in the Kentuckiana area and essentially all over the United States, day in, day out, operate on almost 100% capacity. You know, it waxes and wanes a little bit, but it's not, you know, the ICUs might have been full in, you know, August of 1999, you know, 2010, and they're full again today. The difference is when COVID first hit back, you know, when it first uh, started seeing a lot of ICU cases, you know, people were staying away from the ERs. Um, you know, our volume was down about 30, 35%. So we had tons of extra room to say, okay, you know, we can, we can accommodate, you know, these, this new influx of COVID patients. Well, over the last few months, when we got back to a sense of normalcy, ER and hospital volumes went back to their norm where they're operating at almost hundred percent capacity, you know, with your normal medical conditions, you know, your heart attacks, strokes, things like that. And then now as our COVID admissions are, are coming back, I mean, you know, you know, Clark Memorial and a lot of the local hospitals got down to almost no COVID admissions during that nice lull period. And now we're back all full force and we don't have the room to accommodate that extra volume of COVID patients now. And so it forces us to be very, um, um, you know, creative. And a lot, you know, one of the first things that happens is when you're admitted to the ICU from the ER, you may wait two or three days for an ICU bed to become open. And so, you know, if you have a 30 bed ER and 15 of those beds are filled with people who are already admitted to the hospital, then there's not as much room for the new patients. And then that trickles down to an ambulance comes in with a new patient, but there's no bed to put them in, you know? And so that all trickles down and, and it really creates a lot of log jams at different parts of the, of the system. And so, you know, is there a magic fix for that? No. And, and do hospitals do a great job of, flexing up certain areas and doing things to create um, space for that volume? Absolutely. So you are still safe going to the hospital, but you may have to exert some patience here. You know, it may take a couple of days to get up to your bed. So please be patient with your ER staff and hospitals. You know, it may take you a little longer to get an ambulance, or if you go to the ER, you may have to wait an extra couple hours. That's the reality of what's happening out there. And how does this impact the rest of the healthcare system? Uh, how does this impact urgent cares, primary care, ambulatory care, home health? I mean, what is the impact uh, downstream? Well, it's the same thing. I mean, that even trickles down to them. I'm, the urgent care volumes, um, uh, you know, I know the ones locally are just slammed with patients again because, you know, they, they're, they're seeing that trickle down effect as well. The primary care offices, I mean, you know, they've done an awesome job. And then, you know, they want, you know, say they get somebody sick in there in their urgent care or in the primary care office, you know, the natural thing is send them down to the hospital. And then you're trying to send them to hospitals that don't have room. And it just, it's, it really affects every single aspect of the healthcare system as it kind of trickles its way down. Okay. Um, I want to encourage anyone that has questions to go ahead and drop those in the chat. We're getting close to the end of our hour. I want to make sure that if you have a question that's not been answered, that you, that you have the opportunity to get that question answered. 
Uh, Dr. Yazel, I want to talk uh, about masking. We've talked about it in school systems. Um, you know, a year ago, we had just uh, expired a, a mask mandate locally, I think maybe a, a little bit more than a year ago. Uh, we don't have that currently. We don't have it in the state. Um, where are we with masking? Well, I think that's another one where everybody is way too, too much in all or nothing. It's either, you know, you think everybody should be masked or masks don't work and they don't, you know, they do nothing. The reality is it's somewhere in between. And what data you read depends on where you land on that on that spectrum. Um, you know, there's about masks do work. How much they work, it's hard to tell. Everybody always sends me the one of the guy standing with a bunch of dust in his air and he takes his, his mask off and there's still, you know, stuff on his face and use that as, an, as evidence that masks don't work. My argument is, well, there's a whole lot less, you know, under where his mask was than there was on the rest of his face. And when you get to COVID, you know, that's a, COVID is a dose dependent infection. So even if you're just deflecting some of the particles, you're still getting efficacy there. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. I mean, you can still get infections and things like that. But, you know, in, like I said earlier, in some of our schools that have had masks or some that have started wearing masks, we've seen the quarantines and in-school cases go down and things like that. It's not, but it, you know, it's not, it doesn't put everything to a screeching halt, but it does help. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Um, you know, and so, you know, that's where we land on it. I do think sometimes we spend too much time. I think our, the masks have kind of been the, uh, um, you know, the, the flashpoint for all the arguments and things like that. And I always say, you know, we don't spend enough time talking about distancing. It doesn't matter what you're wearing. If you're not around, you know, within six feet of somebody with COVID, we don't talk enough about that. We don't talk enough about, you know, priming your own personal health, you know, before you even go out you know, making sure that you got a good nutritional status, that you're taking, getting plenty of rest, eating right, taking vitamins, you know, we don't even, we don't talk about that either. All we do, it seems like, is debate masks until we're all blue in the face. Uh, that's is what it is. So. Uh, all right, so I'm going to just kind of go through some of the questions that have submitted, been submitted in the chat, and then we will go ahead and wrap up. Uh, this has been a really great discussion, Dr. Yazel. Um, are healthcare workers who received their last vaccine shot in December or January able to get the booster now? I do think there are some places that are doing that. Um, I'm not, you know, I've seen some reports of that. It is not, um, it's not been uh, approved by the health department for a, a, a the state level to go ahead and start administering that um, through the health department. I do know that there are some locations that I, I've heard that are doing that and it's coming very soon. So, you know, the answer to that is yes, but as far as it being officially approved and cleared, we're not there just yet. So you think a couple of weeks away is what I'm hearing? Yeah, at most, yeah. And where where is the best place for folks to find out more information uh, if they want to wait for the official approval? You know, I, we try to be uh, very interactive with the public on our Clark County Health Department, our clarkhealth.net website. We try to keep constant updates of information. So at least locally, that would be my recommendation on, on when to find out when your, you know, your own personal category is, is ready to go. And uh, we'll make sure that we communicate that, we communicate how to do that. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, the next question is related to youth um, mental health and stress, and I think we've talked quite a bit about that. Um, yeah, I just think it's, I, I can't, I, I think it's probably worth touching again. It's just such an important thing. Yeah. And just having real conversations again and just understanding what they're going through. Just because they're not talking about it doesn't mean they're not worried about it. So, you know, I do think we need to do things to support our, our youth and, you know, make sure that they're still having some social interaction and and just, you know, reaching out and just watching for any red flag signs from our kids. So, you know, it is important. So, Yeah. The next question, Dr. Yazel, is kind of interesting uh, because it seems like everything old is new again. And uh, this question is related to singing in church. Uh, you know, initially in COVID, we there were a lot of um, case studies around uh, choir spread in church. But thoughts on singing in church, either outdoor or indoor, and suggestions about masking during that activity? Well, you know, I think it's, again, another one of these that you need to know your individual risk profile. You know, if you're high risk and unvaccinated, then, you know, that's going to be a, a very dangerous thing for you to either be in the middle of or exposed to or anything like that. You know, if your entire choir is vaccinated and everybody's, you know, being very uh, cautious about not showing up when they're having any symptoms and things, then I think it's reasonable. So, you know, I think that's the, 
that's the thing is it's an individual uh, individual thing and kind of everybody's on the honor system of that. And, you know, I think, you know, as you, if you can move your choirs, or, you know, make sure everybody's spread out a little bit, you know, that helps and things, but I think we all need a little positivity or a lot of positivity, um, you know, around and, and singing in church is, is a very, uh, you know, very important thing for that. So, you know, I'm, I'm by no means going to say no on that. I just think you need to make sure you're taking your own risk profile into consideration. Great. Uh, I've heard some hesitancy to receive the shot based on concern about long-term side effects. Do you have any data to address these concerns? Yeah, you know, I, I think that's one that when, when somebody tells me, I, you know, I am worried about getting the vaccine because it doesn't have, you know, long-term data. I, I think that's reasonable. We don't know that. We don't know a lot about long-term side effects. I will say the science behind how the vaccine is constructed and, you know, looking at other vaccines, I think the risk of long-term side effects is extremely small, but we don't have data on that. We're collecting data and we're going to have a huge pool of data, you know, over the years on that, but we can't say that. Now, have there been other vaccines that are somewhat similar that we can kind of extrapolate from? Like, you know, there's some vaccine development for the, uh, SAR, uh, for the MERS virus and some things like that, you know, and those look to have no long-term side effects. And, I think, you know, I think we can, you know, be relatively comfortable to not expect that for, for this as well. You know, the one thing I always stress is we are starting to see some long-term um, side effects from, uh, from COVID. You know, there, there's a long hauler COVID clinic over in, in Louisville. You know, they're starting to see increased uh, rates of depression and, and you, know, you know, verified, you know, changes in the, you know, chemistry of the brain and things like that in post-COVID patients. You see, you know, I get asked about myocarditis a lot. You know, we've seen some of that from the vaccine. Post-COVID myocarditis is also very common and often more severe. So again, all the long-term side effects of COVID seem to markedly outweigh any risk that we're seeing out of the vaccine itself. Um, the next question is related to, I'm interpreting it as a uh, school, as a school policy. Um, so I'm going to just ask the, the question just in related to the general population. Why do vaccinated people not have to quarantine if they are exposed to a positive person and symptom free? Yeah, because so when you are, if you're vaccinated, it's still, you know, like you heard me mention earlier, breakthrough cases in the vaccination, vaccinated population are very rare. Um, you know, we're seeing a small amount. And so your chances of, of actually becoming a breakthrough case are, are small. You know, the one reason you're starting, you know, what what makes that interesting is in order to become a breakthrough case when you're vaccinated, it takes a really high viral load to do that, a very, very significant exposure. And that's why when they've come down to it and they've said, okay, these vaccinated people who are breakthrough cases are, have enough, enough uh, virus in their system that they could expose others around them who are unvaccinated. So that's where some of the masking side of things came from. But again, the chances of you bringing a breakthrough case are you know, what we say 0.12%. And so that's why um, they don't have to quarantine. They do recommend that you get tested after a verified exposure somewhere between day three and day five, just to make sure that you aren't an asymptomatic spreader or anything, but that risk is low enough that you, that you don't have to quarantine. Okay. Uh, the next question is related to the state uh, the state health mapping related to COVID. Do you expect Clark County to move into the red? We're going to get awful close. Um, you know, the way they do that metric, it's cases per 100,000, which we've been above that threshold for two or three weeks now. And then your seven day positive, your rolling seven day positivity rate. And that has to, that, if we go over 15% and that other metric stays where it is, then we'll go into the red. We've been skirting around 13% or so right now. So we're very close. You know, I don't know how, you know, what, you know, how long has something has to be there to be considered a trend. We do seem to have leveled off um, over the last few days and stayed right about 13%. So I, I don't know that we'll go red. I think we'll get real, real close over the next couple of weeks. Okay. Next question is a two-part question. If I was vaccinated and now have COVID, what is my protection level for the future? Uh, and then also I received J&J &J and didn't hear there was an option for a booster. Will there be such? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question to the first one. Um, I, I don't know. My guess would be excellent protected, to be honest with you, because, you know, if you're a breakthrough case, you're going to have your, your, your immunity from your vaccine. And then again, some more natural immunity from the, from the regular infection as well. I don't have any studies that tell me that. I, you know, that just makes sense to me. So that's my opinion. I would feel very good about your immune status um, if you were a breakthrough case. But, 
we're still getting, you know, that's something where data is still coming in. So don't have any studies that can back that up, but I, I think you're in very good shape. Um, the Johnson and Johnson shot. Yeah. They, they haven't uh, said what they're going to do if there is a booster, you know, necessary. What does that look like? Is that another Johnson and Johnson shot? Do you get one of the Pfizer or Moderna as a, you know, as a booster or is there no booster? I think that's one of those questions that's still getting answered right now. And, and a very fair question to ask, but one that I, we just don't have an answer for you yet. All right, thank you. What type of mask do you recommend? Do you recommend the cloth or the cloth mask still okay? Or do you recommend we uh, move to the, the paper surgical masks? You know, that's another one that it, you know, you, that it depends on what your activities are, what you're doing, you know, what the chances are that you're going to get exposed, things like that. Obviously, N95s provide the best protection. You know, your surgical masks are below that and your cloth masks are below that. You know, if you're a low risk person who's you know, doing some activity where you're not going to encounter a lot of COVID to your knowledge, then a cloth mask is probably fine. If you're going into more higher exposure situation or you're more at risk, then I'd go with a surgical mask. And, you know, if you're in a front facing healthcare worker setting, um, especially doing any kind of, you know, aerosolized procedures or anything, then an N95 is the way to go. Okay. Uh, we're right at one o'clock, Dr. Yazel. Do you have just a few more minutes? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm good. Okay. Good. Um, how do we convince those concerned about quarantining in the schools that getting their children over 12 vaccinated uh, and wearing masks will eliminate some of the quarantines? Well, you know, that's one thing I'm very respectful of is it's a family decision whether or not to vaccinate your child. And, you know, I, my day involves going through a mountain of data. Literally an hour ago, I was looking at vaccine rates in Iceland. Like, I need a hobby. Um, you know, but, and so I have all this stuff right a bit readily available. I mean, this has been consumed my life for the last, you know, couple of years now, you know, not everybody does that. And that's a scary idea to vaccinate your child, you know, with, you know, it's, it's, it's a family decision and it's tough. And so, you know, I do think as more data comes out and you start to see, Hey, you know, everybody who's vaccinated, you know, we've got 53,000 people in our County. We're all doing fine. The kids are all doing fine. You know, and you have to say, hey, there is a little unknown there. I get it. And I'm nervous, but I think it's more important that my kid be in school, you know, get that in-person instruction, that social interaction and things. And I think hopefully that'll start to outweigh some of those concerns and you'll see a better vaccine uptake in the 12 and up population and, and or if the tears go low or even that younger population. Um, and I do think that, you know, I think the other thing is on a more simple level, you know, unfortunately, as long as our numbers are high, like they are, quarantines are going to be a real risk. And People are going to get tired of it and they'll say, you know what, if, uh, if that helps keep my kid in school, then I'll go do it. Okay, great. Um, are you, this is, a, this is a long question and I'm going to add a, add a question to it as well. Are you seeing an increase in ER hospital visits due to adverse reactions of the vaccine, blood clots, irregular heartbeat, neurological issues, et cetera? I've seen a lot of data on the VAERS website along with talks from medical professional friends and they are seeing patients with those issues. It is not talked about in the news and you have to search for those issues. The writer states, that's my main concern with getting vaccinated. Um, the question I'm going to add is, can you talk a little bit about what VAERS is and what the pros and cons of that data set are? Yeah, so it's a adverse, basically the VAERS is a vaccine adverse reaction reporting system. And a lot of you, I know I did when I got my vaccine, I got a text with a link to say I could report uh, you know, whatever symptoms I was feeling and things like that. You know, the one thing I would say is, you know, correlation doesn't always equal causation. So, you know, we're vaccinating, you know, 3 million people in the state of Indiana. You know, there's a decent number of those that are going to have heart attacks, strokes, everything like that at any given time, whether they got the vaccine or not. And so I get it, man. If you have the vaccine and, and a week later, you have a heart attack, people are going, well, it's because of the vaccine. That's not necessarily the case. And we're not seeing increased numbers of a lot of those things. As far as my personal ER interaction, I have not seen significant side effects that I can directly trace back to the vaccine. In fact, the first one, the blood clots, um, that's one thing I see a lot of um, in post-COVID patients. That's been a big risk of mine. Anybody who had COVID that comes in, you know, within the next few months afterwards, it's short of breath. I've seen a lot of blood clots in the lungs and things like that from natural COVID infection. Um, but I've not seen that from vaccines. Uh, you know, we've seen some people that have to come in for an allergic reaction, um, you know, or just, you know, got weak, nausea, nausea, vomiting, things like that. Um, you know, that's something that we've seen periodically. 
as far as some of those more, um, you know, rare things. I'm not saying they don't happen, but there's nothing that I'm seeing with regularity that I can say, this is a real legit risk that we're seeing frequently in the ER. I, I can't say that. And Dr. Yazel, it's my understanding that anyone can report to VAERS. That's correct. That's yeah. correct. So you do have to watch. I mean, that's another one where, you know, the quality of data that's put in there is, is, is questionable. And there's all sorts of biases with, you know, sending somebody a, a, you know, you want to report any symptoms after you've gotten a vaccine. There's a lot of biases that are involved in that information. So I think it's good information to search through and be aware of, but you need to take that into consideration with the whole big picture of what's out there. Okay, great. It's a really important question. Um, are the people who are in the ICU otherwise healthy other than COVID? You know, in general, it's still the same. I, I think honestly, one thing that's probably not talked about enough as a risk factor um, is, is weight. You know, we're, uh, we're an obese nation. Um, I could stand to use, lose a few myself, but the, as your weight gets higher and higher, you know, when you hear of a young person who is in the ICU, a lot of times that's the risk factor versus, you know, some of the other things that are going on. So to see the, you know, extremely healthy, you know, fit person in the ICU is very rare. I mean, I, I will be blatantly upfront on that. You do not see young, healthy people with any regularity. It happens. Everybody can tell you an example of, of where this did, but in general, it is people with, you know, comorbid medical conditions that are, that are populated in ICUs. Okay. Uh, we have reached the end of the questions uh, that were submitted today. Those were really great questions. Thank you all very much. Dr. Yazel, thank you so much for your time today. I think this has been a, a really great discussion and been really informative and uh, really appreciate your time. I know you're uh, just very busy both doing clinical care as well as uh, health department administration and lots of talks just like this. So I really appreciate your time uh, spent with us today. Yeah, just one last thing I'd like to say is just, you know, I think when COVID first started, we really came together as a community and everybody worked together and supported each other and kind of raised everybody else up. And, you know, I know there's a lot of arguing and different, you know, thoughts and philosophies on COVID, but I'd really like to encourage that to be tolerant of each other and really try to get back to that sense of the community because that's how we're going to get through this and, and, and get ahead of it. Thank you, Dr. Yazel, and thanks everyone for joining us today. This concludes our community conversation with Dr. Eric Yazel. I hope everyone has learned something. I know I certainly have. Have a great weekend.